Hello, I'm Johan Chaka with CISMEC, the Southwest Initiative for the Study of Middle East Conflicts. Welcome to the latest in our interview series, CISMEC Presents, a look at the most pressing Middle East conflicts through the eyes of scholars and practitioners. Today, we're with Dr. Juan Cole. Dr. Cole is the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. He's, he's the recent author of Engaging the Muslim World, as well as Napoleon's Egypt Invading the Middle East. He's the author of Informed Comment, one of the most widely read and well-known blogs on the Middle East and Islam, and frequently appears in the media as a commentator on these subjects. Dr. Cole, welcome uh, to Tucson, and welcome to Sismic Presents. It's great to be here. Um, as we speak, the world is witnessing horrible scenes of artillery and mortars raining down on the civilian population of Homs in Syria. The United Security Council is deadlocked on the question of whether to authorize intervention of, of any sort. Um, on the other hand, when we look at uh, cases historically, whether Syria in 1982, Algeria and Iraq in 1991, or Iran in 2009, ins uh, regimes insulated from international pressure appear to have been able to crush mass uprisings, even ones that involve millions of people on the streets. Does the resistance in Syria have any chance at all for success in the absence of intervention or, or external support? Well, it's chances of uh, military success uh, or political success in the, in the short term are low. Uh, the Syrian regime has 5,000 tanks. Uh, it has quite a lot of helicopter gunships and uh, uh, a good deal of artillery. And it is fighting um, two kinds of uprisings, a, uh, an uprising of ordinary people in the streets, uh, of course fairly easy to kill them, uh, and then uh, an uprising of former uh, military men who have defected and formed the, the Syrian Free Army. Uh, those are a little harder for the regime to summarily execute, and indeed the horrible scenes we're seeing from Homs uh, are because the initial Syrian military advance into the neighborhood of Baba Amr in Homs was stopped by the defectors. Um, they set up uh, uh, good defenses of the neighborhood, and it was, it was impossible for the regime to simply sweep into it uh, with infantry, and therefore they have now uh, begun bombarding it with very heavy artillery uh, as an alternative. Uh, but uh, the, the likelihood is that they will prevail over time. So does this mean that, um, as in the case of, for example, um, Poland in 1981 or the Czech uprisings, democracy in Syria may have several decades to wait if intervention fails to materialize? Well, it's entirely possible that the regime will succeed in reasserting itself. Uh, it, on the other hand, it has, by its brutality, uh, deeply damaged its credibility. And I think that the political fallout of this uprising may be more important uh, than the military uh, fallout. That is to say, the Syrian Free Army probably can't overthrow the regime. But the regime does, any government depends on people cooperating with it uh, and uh, uh, thinking it's legitimate. And by now, so much of the country doesn't hold that view of the government, uh, that it's more difficult for it to reassert itself. And we, we've seen how this might work in the sense that while the military has been besieging uh, Homs, Idlib and the areas to the north have gone out of control of the government. And, and at the same time, there have been, for the first time, fairly significant demonstrations in the tonier uh, areas of Damascus itself, the capital. Uh, so you see some, some signs that perhaps uh, the regime is losing legitimacy in parts of the country. 
One of the things that is interesting is the way in which the Arab League has, on the whole, come out on the side of the Arab uprisings, at least in the Sunni countries. Um, and we've seen them partnering with Turkey, uh, the former imperial power in the region, and with Western powers that once played an imperial region in the um, uh, an imperial role in the region as well. How do you account for this sea change in Arab League um, opinion and position towards working with non-Arab powers in contravention of the sovereignty of, of Arab states? Is this not a very significant change? I think it is an important change. I think it, it has somewhat to do with the change in leadership of the Secretary General of the Arab League, and Nabil al-Arabi, I think, suffered under Mubarak and was um, um, uh, briefly foreign minister of revolutionary Egypt. And so a revolutionary is at the head of, uh, of the Arab League at the moment. Uh, the Arab League is deeply divided. Um, it has, uh, it seems to me, uh, now some blocks within it. Uh, and to understand its workings, we have to see the relationship of the blocks. So as the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the very wealthy uh, Gulf uh, oil monarchies, it has the new revolutionary states, uh, Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and Yemen. And, uh, and these, ten, these four states now tend to support uh, the uprisings elsewhere. Uh, and for instance, Tunisia has broken off diplomatic relations with Syria, and uh, Egypt has with, withdrawn its ambassador recently, and the Libyans um, volunteering to go fight. So uh, the, revolu the revolutionary wave in the Arab world uh, is, is a dynamic within the Arab League itself. Uh, and uh, then you have the more traditional monarchies, Jordan and, and Morocco, you have uh, uh, Algeria, which is kind of one of the last of, last the, of, the, of the authoritarian yeah. secular uh, regimes. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that when the GCC, when the oil monarchies get together with the revolutionary states, then you get this push for change. And how and why that happens is a little bit arbitrary. So in the case of Bahrain, as you mentioned, there, there isn't a, a, a common position uh, because the, the GCC opposes the uprising in Bahrain. Uh, and the oil monarchies were not enthusiastic about the changes in Egypt initially, uh, possibly with the, with the exception of Qatar. But, um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi had stabbed all of the Arab League uh, governments in the back over the years, and uh, so they all were very happy to see the end of him, and so the revolutionaries and the GCC could cooperate on this. And um, Syria is aligned with Iran, uh, and so I think the GCC, the oil monarchies who are Sunni and uh, typically have bad relations with Iran, af afraid of Iran, uh, want to see the, the regime fall in, in Syria for their own reasons, not because they're in favor necessarily uh, on principle of democracy, but because they want to, they, they see the Ba'ath regime as, as a support for Iranian assertion of power in the region. Uh, whereas Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, I don't think they care very much about Iran, but they, they are just against now uh, these kind of one-party authoritarian states that kill a lot of people. Well, it is interesting that, um, you know, you mentioned the GCC, the oil-rich chieftains of the Arabian Peninsula, because after all, these are some of the last countries in uh, both the Arab world and the world at large that still have what are essentially absolute monarchies in charge. Surely the effect of seeing the Arab uprisings unfold on their television screens, you know, on Al Arabiya, on Al Jazeera, must be having some sort of transformative impact on the populations of, of these Arab states in terms of their expectations from their own governments. Do you see greater um, social and political activism, um, greater demands for reform coming from within these states? And how do you see uh, these governments responding to them? Because so far, mostly they, attempt, they seem to be attempting to buy off their population, massively increasing subsidies, um, and combined with, you know, big arms purchases from America to stave off the, the Iranians. Do you see prospects for change? 
The Gulf uh, oil monarchies uh, are opaque. It's very difficult to penetrate the internal politics of a place like Saudi Arabia. Obviously, there are dissidents, there are dissident websites, but you don't know how representative they might be. It could be some crank in Jeddah. Uh, and so it's very difficult to read uh, the Saudi population, for instance. Uh, there were a few demonstrations uh, in spring of 2011 in Saudi Arabia. But as you say, the government announced a very substantial subsidy program for people, which is very costly but it, it appears to have tampened down the discontents. The same thing happened in Kuwait. The Kuwait government just announced it was giving everybody $2,500. Right. So I guess you know you could make a revolution or you could get $2,500. Right. So people decided to go for the, for the money. Um, Kuwait, to be fair, also has moved in the direction of having parliamentary elections and the women have been given a vote and uh, there's kind of mechanisms for blowing off steam in, in Kuwait that don't exist really in Saudi Arabia or some of the other states. Right. There are other places where the, the social dynamics um, maybe tell against uh, substantial discontent. Qatar, for instance, uh, probably has no more than 250,000 citizens. Right, the rest of them being expatriates. The rest of them being expatriate guest workers who are given two year revolving visas. So um, the emir of Qatar, uh, and remember in any population, two-thirds are children. Right. So the emir of Qatar is dealing with a uh, almost a Massachusetts old-style, you know, right. a, 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 a town, uh, a town model of, of governance where I'm quite sure if he wants to know what his... Uh, his subjects think he doesn't uh, have to go very far. He, does, does he? he doesn't have to uh, hold a referendum. I mean, right. he, uh, so, um, uh, I, I I'm not sure it's fair to call Qatar an absolute monarchy. Uh, the Emir has a diwan, and he has sort of mechanisms of trying to make sure the government policy is consensual and uh, and so forth. So, uh, I mean, there may be some hidden. Uh, uh, democratic aspects to some of these oil monarchies that are not apparent on the surface. Saudi Arabia is much closer to being an absolute monarchy right. and, uh, and a much bigger country, uh, some 23 million. Uh, and so uh, it's the one that, uh, that you were characterizing earlier. The United Arab Emirates, again, it's a coalition of seven emirates. Each of them has its own uh, economic and demographic characteristic. Uh, Dubai is largely a finance center with a very large expatriate population of some million Pakistanis right. and uh, South Asian Muslims uh, so that you would uh, do better learning Urdu to go there than, than oh, Arabic yes. probably. Yes. Uh, uh, Abu Dhabi is an oil state uh, and uh, is, is different in character uh, from Dubai. So um, the, the Gulf cooperation countries um, are are, uh, I think, difficult to talk to talk about as a group. Uh, they're very different from one another. And the way that the oil works, creating these very large expatriate populations who then are rightsless because they're right. not they, citizens. They lack the rights of citizenship. They can't strike. If they make any trouble, their visas are withdrawn and they're sent back to India or wherever they came from, uh, and so forth. So, uh, And then, of course, the local people who are citizens, who get very substantial uh, inputs from the state, free education through the PhD, free health care, uh, very low mortgages on large houses. Minimal taxation. Uh, minimal taxation. Uh, they have to think long and hard as to whether they want to upset that apple cart. Uh, so I'm not saying it can't happen. Right. Uh, but it, it is a different dynamic than a place like Egypt where two-thirds of the people live on less than two dollars a day. Well, your contrasting of the, of the rather different uh, social and political conditions um, to be found across the Arab world brings to mind um, your fellow historian Eric Hobsbawm's characterization of the Arab uprisings, where he compared them to the revolutions that swept across Europe in 1848. Um, a chain reaction of sparks that appears very dramatic in the short term, but really only begins to reshape the landscape in the longer term towards democratization and liberalization. 
when we look at the states where the ruling family has fallen, uh, for example, Yemen, uh, where the Saleh clan is still very firmly in charge, uh, Egypt, where the army has uh, shown very little interest in ceding power to the civilian executive and legislature, and um, Syria, where we have a very um, bloody uh, resistance in, in progress that we've discussed earlier. It looks in some ways as if Tunisia is the only Arab state that is close to seeing democracy actually um, unfurl. Do you, do you share your, your colleague uh, Hob, uh, Eric Hobsbawm's uh, views on this, or, or do you have a different take? I think it matters uh, how, um, how you look at it. If you look at it from the point of view of political economy, then actually there have been very substantial changes. Because these were mm, presidents for life, um, authoritarian states with a very narrow clique at the top of them, the president, his family, his cronies, his family's cronies, uh, and so forth. If you remove him, uh, then you remove all the others as well, the hangers on. And, and since the amount of resources being monopolized by these uh, crony regimes were so enormous, I mean, billions and billions of dollars, by removing the president, you really have opened up the economic system. Uh, I mean, I'm quite sure if you did a Gini coefficient uh, study mm. of these places, uh, all of a sudden they're much more equal. Right. Uh, Gini co coefficient is the, is, is the measurement of, of economic equality in a society. And they were very unequal, uh, but, uh, but now the, the top has been locked off. You have people like Ahmed Ez, who uh, was a crony of the Mubarak uh, family, and a steel magnate created by the regime as such, really through patronage, through patronage, through insider trading on economic. You know, the government knows what it's going to do in the economy, so it can tip its cronies as to what the good investments are. Uh, and uh, he had been promoted as uh, a major figure inside the the, the ruling uh, party, the National Democratic Party, uh, and and he's on trial. Right. Well, that's that's not nothing. You see, uh, it, it's, it wouldn't, uh, the, uh, the estimate for the amount of property that changed hands in the French Revolution is only 5%. Uh, I think it's much more in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya than that it's already. So these are social revolutions just because of the character of the old regimes uh, and uh, of, of a very substantial nature maybe with the exception of, of, of Yemen, as you say, there hasn't been such a big change there uh, and nobody's been put on trial. But um, in, uh, in Libya, it was an oil state. The, the Qaddafi clan had squirreled away billions abroad. Uh, it, its cronies uh, also in the, in the state oil company and in the, in the revolutionary committees uh, had become enormously wealthy. Those have all been swept away. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think the change, if you look at it from that perspective of political economy, has already been enormous. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in 2010, uh, the, the Nahda party, the Renaissance party in, in Tunisia was being viciously persecuted. People were being put in jail and tortured as prisoners of conscience. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was being repressed, uh, and, and, the, and the New Left in Egypt were, were, were in jail, sometimes just wantonly killed. A, a, a leftist uh, investigator of police corruption, uh, Khalid Saeed in Alexandria, yes. was, was just, they just, the police just went into the internet shop where he was and killed him, and with, with impunity. And uh, his body was unrecognizable and helped spark some of the, the protests. That... Yes. So, um, uh, the, you know, the people in Egypt now are uppity. I was there last summer, and if the police, bought, and mostly the police had absented themselves, mm. they were a little bit afraid of people. And uh, But if they bothered anybody, people would uh, accost them. They would say, weren't you with Mubarak? Aren't you a counter-revolutionary? We will tahrir you. Uh, <laughs> tahrir has now become a verb. It has now become a verb. Uh, and it means to just to gather people in large numbers to protest an injustice. Uh, well. You know, I don't think you can discount the change in, in mentality that, 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 that these events uh, uh, indicate. And um, 
So uh, we don't really in the United States, you know, in high school, we don't get past the American Revolution with regard mm. to continental European history. And so I'm not sure how many Americans know very much about the revolutions of 1848. Well, let's just say they were a disappointment to the left. Uh, they looked like they might cause a vast amount of change, but then you had Emperor Napoleon III came back afterwards in, in, in France, and, uh, and it was much later that anything revolutionary happened in, in, in Europe. Uh, so the, the question that Eric Hobsbawm is, is, is raising, and uh, you know, it's an honor to be mentioned in the same company, he's a great historian, but uh, uh, I, I think that we can already see uh, a, a, a quality and a quantity of change in these revolutionary Arab states that is substantially beyond what tended to happen in 1848 in Europe. Dr. Cole, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here, and uh, hope to see you again here. Thank sometime. you so much, Johan.